welcome to the Children's and Teen Health Summit. I'm your host, Carla Atherton, founder and director of the Lotus Health Project, lotushealthproject.com, where we empower people to get healthy and stay healthy in mind, body, and spirit, and on the social, global, and environmental levels. For this session of the summit, I'm excited to be speaking with Dr. Tom O'Brien about gluten and its effects on our children's brains. Dr. Tom O'Brien is an internationally recognized speaker and workshop leader specializing in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac disease as they occur inside and outside of the intestines. He is the founder of TheDoctor.com. He has recently hosted the paradigm shifting The Gluten Summit, A Grain of Truth, bringing together 29 of the world's experts on celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity at TheGlutenSummit.com. Welcome to the summit, Dr. Tom. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, it's an honor to have you here. You are the gluten master. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I know I'm saying this, you know, but other people say it as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and so, you know, when when putting together this summit, I was really wanting to include actually you in particular, but this this particular topic of gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, which are two different things, and we'll get into that later, but the whole issue of gluten, uh, because, I mean, we look around, like the grocery stores now, we're having labeling that says gluten-free, a lot of people are going gluten-free, um, there's a lot of talk about gluten-free and gluten sensitivity right now, um, especially with children, and, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that, whether that's a valid thing, that people are doing this because they really need to for a health reason, and some think it's a fad, like something people just think it's like, you know, some new thing that people think that they should be doing. So everybody's kind of jumping on the wagon. And so to quell those, I don't know if it'd be accusations or assumptions. Can you tell us what gluten sensitivity actually is? Yes, thank you. Perhaps we'll start with what is gluten yeah, sure. so that people have an understanding. And the International Celiac Symposium occurs every two years. Uh, 2007, New York, 2009, I don't know where it was, 2011, Oslo, 2013, Chicago, every two years. And uh, in 2011, they, they came up with a consensus statement, said, you know, can we just agree on the terminology of what all this stuff is so that all the scientists and researchers and doctors and parents uh, are on the same page? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing, the big umbrella overview, the one that covers the whole world of a problem with gluten is a gluten related disorder. Right. So if a person comes in and says, you know, when I eat wheat, I don't feel good. Well, Mrs. Patient, you've got a gluten related disorder. Mm -hmm. what, kind, what kind of disorder? We don't know. Let's find out. And then underneath that umbrella term of the big picture, there are a number of possible ways it might manifest. Mm -hmm. The one that people are most familiar with is an allergy. Now, allergies are when you do skin prick tests. And you know your doctor pokes a bunch of uh, areas in your back uh, with little needles to see if there's a skin response. Um, that's looking for an IgE reaction. There are... I need to back up and say that the immune system is the armed forces of your body, you know, that's there to protect you. Mm -hmm. There's an army, an air force, a marines, a coast guard, IgE, IgA, IgG, IgM. It's important to know this when you're, check when you're um, trying to see what's wrong with your child, to know that there's different branches of the armed forces. The first test that was ever developed commercially for doctors to use was the skin prick test back mm -hmm. in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And it showed, uh, if it showed that there was a problem uh, with a particular food, it was called an allergy. And you've got an allergy to this food, Mrs. Patient. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's an IgE reaction. And a whole specialty, subspecialty of medicine developed around that concept. They're called allergists. Okay. So al allergists are trained in looking for an IgE reaction. So that's the Air Force. But maybe the Air Force is not responding. Maybe it's the Marines. That's called an IgA reaction. And if you have an IgA reaction, the skin prick test doesn't test for that. Mm -hmm. It tests the Air Force and only the Air Force. So if a test for the Air Force, the skin prick test comes back positive, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. but, if it, 
But if it comes back negative, it doesn't mean you don't have a problem with that food. Here's the next example. Okay. The army. The army is called IgG, an IgG reaction. There are some doctors that do food sensitivity tests. They mistakenly call them food allergy tests, mm -hmm. where they'll look at 90 foods at one time. And th that's looking at an IgG reaction. So if a food comes back positive on an IgG reaction, you got a problem with that food. But if it comes back negative, it may be that the Air Force has uh, been called out and that's an IgE reaction, the skin prick test. And the IgG reaction doesn't check for that. So all of our doctors currently look at one branch, uh, the Army, maybe the Air Force, it may be the Marines, but they only look at one branch. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at all the branches of the armed forces or as many as possible to determine, does my child have a problem with this food? So that's the first thing to understand. So under the topic of a gluten-related disorder, the umbrella of a gluten-related disorder, you may have an allergy, that's IgE. That's the skin prick test. Or you may have a um, IgG reaction. That's called, back up before I get to that, you may have a problem in your gut that's attacking the intestines. That's called celiac mm -hmm. disease. And that's where most of the research has been done. About 19,000 studies have been done on celiac disease. Celiac disease your intestines are a tube. The tube is 20, 25 feet long. It starts at the mouth and it goes to the other end. It's one big long tube. Now for our parents that are listening to this, if you consider the tube to be like a donut that's just stretched out, one big long donut, and you look down that donut and the food goes down this tube. It's going down this tube. It's really not in the body yet. It's still in the tube. It's gotta go through the walls of the donut to get into the bloodstream and then to go everywhere else to be used as nutrients. So as that food is going down the tube, the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This shag over here is where calcium is absorbed. This shag, magnesium. This shag, the B vitamins. All the shags absorb different nutrients. That's how we absorb our nutrients. Now, celiac disease is when the shags wear down and you've got Berber. If you've got Berber, you don't absorb calcium. Mm -hmm. You get osteoporosis. That's why in the Archives of Internal Medicine, they published a study in 2006 that said all osteoporotic patients need to be checked for celiac because okay. celiac disease is such a common cause of their osteoporosis. Okay. Now, and so I show that study to the doctors and say, so doctors, if the Archives of Internal Medicine say every osteoporotic patient just needs to be checked because it's, such the co it's a common cause, which one are you not going to check? Hmm. And they just sit there, you know, kind of like a deer in headlights because they've never thought about that before. Of course, if you have osteoporosis, you give calcium mm -hmm. and magnesium. And if you're a really good nutritionist, you give vitamin K mm -hmm. and boron and strontium because they're all important in building new bone. And if you're trying to safe, uh, make the patient feel safer, you give them the medications called bisphosphonates. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with bisphosphonates is that they stimulate more bone production. The x-rays show that, but the bone is balsa wood instead right. of oak. Yeah. And the women that take bisphosphonates have just as many fractures as the women that had similar levels of osteoporosis that don't take the bisphosphonates. Mm -hmm. They have just as many fractures in the future because you can't make strong bone if you're not absorbing the nutrient. Mm. So if your shags are worn down, and you've got celiac disease, you don't absorb your nutrients, and the drugs stimulate new bone formation, but the, it's balsa wood and you get just as many fractures. So that's under the umbrella of gluten-related disorders, you have wheat allergies, IgE reaction. Okay. You have celiac disease, which is the shag swearing down, and you've got Berber, and you've got this category called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Okay. And that's where the IgG, or IgA reactions often occur to wheat. Okay. And so non-celiac gluten sensitive, no, it's not a fad. No, it's not a fantasy. No, it's not fiction. It's a fact. And I'm going to give you a couple of studies because there's a whole lot of hullabaloo right now yep. around this topic of, oh, it's just a fad. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. So what happened was that there was a blogger who wrote an article 
that the newspaper in England picked up on uh, where he said, hey, look at this study that came out last year in 2013. No effects of gluten in patients with self-reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity after dietary reduction of fermentable, poorly absorbed short-chain carbohydrates. So this blogger read this article. No, he didn't read the article. He read the title of the article mm. and said, see, there's no effects of gluten. And then the newspaper picked up on it. And then they picked up on it over here in the U.S. And the Wall Street Journal had an article about it. New York Times had an article. Lots of local cities had articles. It's a fad. It's a fad. And it's because of some blogger that didn't read the study. Mm -hmm. if, if he had read the study, he would have seen that's not what the authors were saying at all. What they were saying is that if you take out all carbohydrates from a patient's diet, then um, um, they don't seem to have an effect of gluten because gluten's a carbohydrate anyway. Mm. And they didn't, there's a lot of technical stuff about the article, but you just have to read the article and then you understand what they're trying to say. They were focusing on the fermentable carbohydrates, are called FODMAPs. They were not focusing on the gluten proteins in wheat, and that's what that paper was about. And the same group, the same group of authors published a paper this year, three months ago, and the same group of authors, and the title of this paper was Randomized Clinical Trial. Gluten may cause depression in subjects with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, mm -hmm. an exploratory clinical study. And what they showed in that study is, short, and this is a quote, short-term exposure to gluten specifically induced current feelings of depression with no effect on other indices, meaning they didn't have celiac disease. This mm -hmm. is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If you have a sensitivity, it causes depression in a large number of people. Mm -hmm. So the same group of authors. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not saying there's no effect. They're saying that they were... Um, the, this blogger just read the study wrong. And then the big kahuna study came out um, uh, two months ago. I've been waiting for it. And it came out two months ago. And this big kahuna study that just nails the whole topic uh, is a multi-center study, meaning it was from 38 Italian centers, all recognized as referral centers, meaning doctors send their patients to these centers mm -hmm. all over the country. And they were all included in the register of the Italian Health Ministry for the diagnosis of gluten-related disorders. So these are these centers in Italy that are assigned to look for, do, do people have a problem with gluten? Mm -hmm. There were 27 centers that were gastroenterology centers. Five were internal medicine, four were pediatric. Two were allergy centers. So this is the big kahuna study. They looked at over 5,000 patients. Oh. And the title of the study was an Italian pers perspective multi-center survey on patients suspected of having non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And what did they find in this study? What they found was that, of course, there is this thing for some people called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And what are some of the symptoms that you might have if your shags haven't worn down, but you've got a problem with gluten? 68% mm -hmm. lack of well-being, 64% tiredness, 54% headaches, 39% of these 5,000 people, anxiety, 38% foggy mind, 32% numbness and tingling, 31% joint muscle pain, 29% skin rash, 25% weight loss, 23% anemia, and then depression, dermatitis, rhinitis, which is uh, inflammation in the nose, asthma, that the lists go on and on of the types of symptoms that people will demonstrate with when they have a problem with gluten without celiac disease. So this concept of it's a fad is utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. And there, the papers are very clear that show that it is at least six times and some papers as much as 20 times more common to have non-celiac gluten sensitivity as it is to have celiac disease. Mm. So it's much more common, much more prevalent. It's, it's affecting our kids more and more often. Okay. Well, yeah. There was like a little tiny spot where I lost your audio. And you said that the, the study that you mentioned, the first one, that they were testing the proteins and not the, and then you said something else. 
Yes, it's called FODMAPS. FODMAPS. Okay, FODMAPS, so F-O-D-M-A-P-S, FODMAPS. It's fermentable, poorly absorbed, short chain carbohydrate. Okay, got it. Okay, you know what? I'm going to throw in another question there about that because um, is it like can gluten sensitivity cause celiac? Like can you end up celiac by not addressing your gluten sensitivity? Absolutely. That is the mechanism by which celiac develops. And why is celiac increasing in the world today? And why is gluten sensitivity increasing in the world today? Some people have theorized, and it seems to make sense on the surface, it's not accurate, but they've theorized that, well, it's because of the GMO foods. You know, the the wheat's different. And, well, no, the wheat is not genetically modified. It's been hybridized, but it's not genetically modified. But that's not the reason. And there's no question that the incidence has gone up in the last 60 years, 6 mm-hmm. zero. In the last 60 years, it's gone up 400%. 400. And the people, 400%. And people who get celiac disease, the, um, their lifespan and their quality of life has gone down 3.86 fold. So not quite 400%. We call it the 400 400, mm-hmm. but it's really not. It's 400% increase in frequency and 3.86 fold or 386% increase in dying earlier in life. Wow. And so there's no question it's getting worse. There's absolutely no question. The studies are very clear. All these people that are saying it's a fad, they're just going for sensationalism or they've not read the papers. Yeah. So the doctors who are saying, well, it's a fad. Really, man? Really? You, you are a doctor and you say that to people? Have you read the studies? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you just have to read the studies. If you go to my website, thedr.com, I've put a number of the studies up there. You can just read them and read what the researchers say. So there's no question that it's worse and it's getting worse quicker. The reason it's happening, and this is so important for our kids, and yes. I really appreciate the opportunity to be talking to you, Carla, for your summit and and your target audience are moms. And thank mainly. you for doing it. Yeah, of course. And the reason this is happening is because my good friend, Dr. Mark Houston, is the world's leading vascular biologist. And that's a person who studies the health of the blood vessels. And he runs the Hypertension Institute, that's high blood pressure. He runs the Hi- Hypertension Institute at Vanderbilt University. And Mark has a great way of saying it. He says, the body has a limited number of responses to an unlimited number of insults. Mm. And we're getting more insults every day. If you read about fluoride, you do an OMG about fluoride. If you read about mercury in tuna fish, you do an OMG about mercury. If you read about bisphenol A in plastic bottles, you read a, you do an OMG about bisphenol A, that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that we're exposed to that never before in our history have we, we been exposed to. And the result of all this, and we have a limited number of ways of responding to an unlimited number of insults, meaning we're not equipped to handle bisphenol A or polysorbate 60 or uh, monosodium glutamate or other glutamates. We're not equipped to handle this very well. Mm -hmm. And what happens is somewhere down the road, we develop what's called a loss of oral tolerance, Mm. meaning the straw that broke the camel's back. All of a sudden, we can't tolerate this stuff anymore, and our immune system starts trying to protect us. It it doesn't just let it slide by anymore. Mm -hmm. It says, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm overwhelmed with this stuff. There's way too many foreigners in my city right now. Mm -hmm. There's way too many illegals in here, and, you know, they're sleeping on the streets. My kids are not safe walking down the street. Way too many. We have to do something about this. And then you activate the armed forces, you activate the law enforcement, you activate the immune system to start to take care of this in your body. And then there's collateral damage. And that's what happens with gluten sensitivity with or without celiac disease. Okay. So, and so that causes the gluten sensitivity. So there's a, you know, actually first, uh, we haven't actually talked about food as like a vehicle for gluten. So what actually, like what foods are gluten containing foods? Really good question. So the first part of that is gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. Okay. And we have to understand that because there's gluten in rice, there's gluten in corn, there's gluten in quinoa. 
There's gluten in most grains. Mm -hmm. So it's not that gluten is bad for you, but there is a family of glutens in wheat, rye, and barley. Okay. Those are the ones that are toxic and they're different than the others in that the human body cannot break them down. If you think of protein like a pearl necklace and hydrochloric acid that our stomachs make when we eat, hydrochloric acid undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. But now it's other enzymes that have to like act like scissors to cut each pearl off of the necklace. They're called amino acids. And then those pearls go right through the shags of the intestines into the bloodstream and our body uses those amino acids to build new muscle, to build new brain hormones called neurotransmitters, to build all the tissue that we need to thrive. The problem with the toxic proteins of wheat, rye, and barley is that we don't have the scissors to break them down into little pearls. Mm -hmm. So they break down into clumps of pearls. There's a 33 brick clump or a 33 pearl clump, a 17 pearl clump, a 21 pearl clump. And these clumps cause inflammation in the intestines that causes a tear in the intestines called intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Now these clumps of pearls get into the bloodstream, this 33 pearl clump and the immune systems and you get overwhelmed because you have toast for breakfast, you get, you get a sandwich for lunch, you get pasta for dinner, pancakes for breakfast the next day, sandwich for lunch, croutons on your salad at dinner, maybe a cookie in there or a piece of cake. We're eating these toxic gluten proteins day in, day out, day in, day out, every day of our lives. The most common food we eat for the vast majority of it is gluten-containing foods. Most common if you think about it. Most people never thought about it that way, but just keep a list. Mm. How often you're exposed to gluten and you see it's multiple times a day, every day, mm -hmm. until one day there's so much of this toxic compound in your system now that the straw that broke the camel's back, your immune system says, we got a problem here, I can't deal with this anymore. And the immune system starts fighting it. Now you make these antibodies that go out into the bloodstream to destroy that 33 pearl clump. And the problem is there's collateral damage. Mm -hmm. And wherever your, wherever your genetic weak link is, you know, you pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, it's your heart, your brain, your kidney, your livers, wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where you get the collateral damage from the immune system trying to protect you from the toxic proteins of gluten. Mm. So are you talking like the gluten actually causing an autoimmune response or just an immune response in your body? No, well, but that's the problem is the autoimmune response. You know, um, I did a, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, the Gluten Summit yes. uh, a, few, a few months ago. Um, I traveled the world and interviewed the world leaders, the top people in the world. I went to Oxford, England, interviewed Dr. Michael Marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Marsh is mm -hmm. the godfather of diagnosing celiac disease. Uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, and Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld. Uh, Bologna, Italy, and Professor Umberto Volta. Uh, and, and you hear these people on the summit, on the Gluten Summit, and when you listen to them, you, you because I know the questions to ask, mm -hmm. uh, cause, because I've read their research papers. So, Professor Volta, when you write in your paper this, does it mean this? And they say, yes. Well, would that mean this? Yes, exactly. And I say, do you hear that, people? Here we have the world's expert on non-celiac gluten sensitivity telling you that it is a very common cause of depression mm -hmm. and or what, whatever the point was that I was making. So when you listen to the Gluten Summit, you hear 29 hours of the world experts. I and mean, it takes you two months to listen to all of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, People don't have the extra time, but when you're driving, you listen to a little bit, and you find some you like more than others. But the result is you do an OMG again and again and again. And the main emphasis of the Gluten Summit, the primary reason I did it, the primary reason that I'm doing this out in the world, teaching doctors and the general public wherever I can, is that the number one complication of a toxic response to gluten is that it causes autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. It's a primary cause in the development of autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are when your immune system attacks yourself, your brain, your heart, your liver, wherever your genetic weak link is. So 
I did the test on myself eight years ago, mm -hmm. and I, I had antibodies. I had three different antibodies elevated to my brain. Wow. And I said, what? <laughs> I had myelin basic protein that causes MS when you kill off enough tissue. Yeah. I had cerebellar antibodies that causes older people to be unable to keep their balance mm. and walk straight. That's why you see mo almost all old people, they walk very guardedly mm -hmm. as opposed to gingerly in life. Isn't that a great word, gingerly? I wonder if that <laughs> came from Ginger Rogers. I, I wonder don't know. If that it's a good word. <laughs> uh, I have to agree. And, <laughs> and, and the third antibody I had was um, gangliosides. It causes numbness and tingling. And I called the lab and I said, what's this? This is a mistake. And they said, no, it's not. I said, do it again. They said, we did. We know it's you. We did it again. Yeah. It's accurate. And that's when I realized eight years ago just how serious this was because I didn't have any symptoms. But I was in the process of developing MS. Mm. And I didn't have any symptoms yet that I knew of. So this whole world has developed now, Carla, uh, where you now can identify where's the weak link in your chain. Where is your body attacking its own tissue years before you have any symptoms? And that was the whole basis of the gluten summit. So yes, when you have a sensitivity to gluten, yes, it is a component in the development of autoimmune diseases of all type. And yes, it's in kids. It's, it's rampant in kids. You know, this is the first time in history, I don't know if any of your speakers have said this yet, but it's so shocking. Every speaker should say it again and again. And that is, it's the first time in written history in the last seven years now, mm -hmm. children born today have a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. Yep. They're going to die at an earlier age than you. Yep. Nobody said that, but I put that in the intro to the summit, why I'm doing it. Absolutely right. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've got our head in the sands about that. And, uh, and, and parents don't mean to, but they just don't have the tools to get the big picture overview of why this is. This is the big picture overview. The big picture overview is it's such a toxic world we live in and your body has a limited number of responses to an unlimited number of insults. Mm -hmm. And you, your body breaks down and it's breaking down earlier and earlier and earlier. The studies have come out in the last two years out of Mexico City. Uh, actually from the University of Montana, but this, the, the, they went to Mexico City and they studied kids in Mexico City. And kids in Mexico City are showing signs of Alzheimer's. Already the kids are because, and it's autoimmune aspect of Alzheimer's, because they're breathing the toxic air into their lungs, it's damaging their lungs, and it's causing the same inflammatory response that gluten causes in the gut. Mm. And it triggers the same types of autoimmune responses that gluten does in the gut. It's a limited number of uh, responses to an unlimited number of insults. That's why it's a shorter projected lifespan for our kids today than what we have. And we have to change this. Yeah. The reason I talk about this topic is because this is the most common food. Let me back up. The development of autoimmune diseases requires three things for almost all autoimmune diseases. It requires a genetic vulnerability to that disease. Mm -hmm. It requires an environmental trigger, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yep. And it re requires intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. Yes. So the most common environmental trigger in our world today is the food we eat. Mm-hmm. That's the most common environmental trigger. It's the food we eat two, three, four times a day. You know, we put three to five tons of food in our body over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Every molecule of that food is going to be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. There's no neutrals. Every molecule is going to be one or the other. And gluten, the toxic gluten proteins, is the most common environmental insult we have for most of us. That's why I talk about gluten yeah. is because it is the trigger in the development of the autoimmune syndromes before disease for most of us. And we just don't recognize it. Yeah. So the tests are out now so that you can identify the gluten sensitivity. You also can identify the weak link in the chain. Uh, is it your brain? Is it your heart, your lungs, your liver? And you can see where you sit or where your child sits in that whole picture of what is eventually going to cause symptoms for them and eventually take them down. 
And okay, two things that are going in my head right now. You know, with that, the food, that's one of those things when you say, Dr. Tom, that we can do, have the most control over. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. We Very can good turn point. that on and off. We can, you know, prevent or, or. So, how do people slow that or they see this reaction happening? Is it just simply just getting off the gluten? Or would you suggest that people, you know, really finding, find out? where like if they're just sensitive to gluten or if they have or if they have celiac is that important to know like to differentiate between the two i really want to be known in the world as the guy who is fanatical on this message and the message is everyone who is not happy with how their body is functioning mm -hmm. with all the efforts they're trying you know the foods they choose or the vitamins they take the exercise whatever if you're not happy feeling that you're really op operating at optimum potential, just check accurately for a gluten sensitivity. Just mm. check. It's not that everyone has to go off gluten, although it doesn't make sense to eat it when we don't have to, mm -hmm. but everyone needs to be checked if they're not happy with how their bodies are functioning right now. And you just have to be checked accurately. Okay. Yeah, good advice. Um, and so, and too, as you're talking, I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of people, I, I mean, a lot of people just in conversation, you get together with friends and family, uh, you know, you know, you have a buffet, you, ha you know, you eat together, right? This is a social thing. And so I hear a lot of people say, oh, I feel terrible after they ate or yeah, I eat bread and it makes me bloated. And it's really like, um, you know, we're, we're just so used to it that it's not something that's on our radar. But really like what you're saying, Dr. Tom, is that this, uh, you know, a reaction to food and, and even maybe more foods even than gluten, but gluten in particular um, is really causing significant damage. And your body, by being bloated or gaseous or skin issues or all these depression, all these things that you were mentioning, lots and lots and lots of stuff, um, is really just telling you, it's, well, it's telling you there's a problem and also that there's damage being done to your body. You're absolutely right. Uh, perhaps if I give you the visual on what these antibodies do, sure. um, it'll be helpful for everyone. Okay. So think of a vaccination for measles. They give you a shot of the bug measles and your brain says, whoa, what's this that's in the bloodstream? This is not good for me. You, yo, general, and you've got Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. General, you now are general measles. Take care of this. Yeah. General measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers. Those soldiers are called antibodies. And they're trained to go out into the bloodstream and they're looking for measles, exclusively measles. Think of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he's got his head out of a big Humvee, the sunroof of a Humvee, big submachine gun. He's got those dark glasses on. You know, here in California, we call him the governator. <laughs> so you know, he's got that big sub over there, over there. And he's firing these chemical bullets called cytokines that are going after measles to destroy the measles. General measles is watching all of this. And when all the measles bugs are destroyed, general measles says, OK, turn off the assembly line. We don't need more soldiers out there right now. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have any measles antibodies in your bloodstream right now, Carla, unless you've been exposed, then you should. But if you're ever exposed, again, General Measles, he's vigilant the rest of his life. He's on guard mm -hmm. for measles. If you're ever exposed, he just has to flip the switch and turn, turn on the assembly line. He doesn't have to build it again. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations months ahead of time for yellow fever and dengue fever, all these weird diseases. But if you go back 10 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. Right, yeah. And we, we've all heard of booster shots. Well, booster shot just turns on the assembly line again to start making the soldiers. And general measles is called a memory B cell, okay? Mm -hmm. When you have elevated antibodies to gluten, you've got a memory B cell to gluten. And so for the rest of your life, if you come back with a sensitivity to gluten, it's toast. And I guess that's a pun. You know, it's, <laughs> it's your, your toast for gluten. You can't because when general gluten starts making the antibodies, turns on the assembly line, making the antibodies, Arnold is now out there in the bloodstream. Over there. 
Uvidur, and he's firing chemical bullets looking for the gluten molecule. Mm -hmm. Now, when he's looking at the gluten molecule, it's, it's um, a number of amino acids long. Remember, it's clumps of pearls that um, get 33 uh, pearl clump, 17 pearl clump, all these different clumps of pearls. Let's say it's the antibodies to the 33 pearl clump. And Arnold's looking for the 33 pearl clump called alpha gliadin. That's the technical name for it. Mm -hmm. So Arnold's firing his chemical bullets. And let's say that 33 pearl clump, I'm going to call it AABCD uh, for the amino acids. But there's 33 amino acids. I'm, not, I'm just not going to do 33 letters. Right. But it's AABCD. And he's looking for AABCD. And he fires his, amino acid, his uh, bullets to go after those amino acid clumps. Now, the bloodstream goes everywhere in the body, right? Blood goes everywhere in the body. So as the blood is going by, let's say, the thyroid, the surface of the thyroid that's facing the bloodstream is made up of proteins and fats. Mm -hmm. Proteins are made up of amino acids. There are hundreds of amino acids long. Big, long chains of amino acids make up the proteins on the surface of the thyroid or your liver or your brain. Big, long amino acids. Those hundreds of amino acid long proteins uh, on the surface of the thyroid include A, A, B, C, D as part of the hundreds of amino acid combination. Mm -hmm. Arnold's looking for A, A, B, C, D so over there and fires his chemical bullet at the thyroid. Now you damage a thyroid cell. Mm -hmm. When you damage a thyroid cell, your body makes antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cell. Oh, and, I see. And we're, we're making antibodies to all of our tissue. That's why there's a normal range for antibodies to myelin, a normal range for antibodies to your cerebellum, to your muscle, to your bone, to your thyroid, to your liver. There's a normal level of antibodies to have because you have to have the garbage trucks that are cleaning up the old damaged cells, getting rid of them, so you can make new, healthier cells to okay. keep you going and keep you alive and vibrant. So it's normal to have some antibodies to your tissue. But when Arnold is uh, shooting his chemical bullets at AABCD on your thyroid, you're killing off more thyroid cells than you should be. Mm -hmm. Now you have toast for breakfast. You make antibodies to AABCD. You have pasta for lunch. You make antibodies to A, B, C, D. You have uh, lasagna for dinner. You make antibodies to A, A, B, C, D. And Arnold goes boom, 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 including at your thyroid again and again and again and again. And then your body has to make more thyroid antibodies to get rid of the damaged thyroid cells again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And eventually, your body, that mechanism making the antibodies to your thyroid has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And now you develop the autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Right or Graves' disease, or one of the other thyroid diseases. Or in my case, it would have been MS, or cerebellum shrinkage, mm -hmm. or numbness and tingling, so my nerves would start to go. That, it just depends on where your genetic weak link is. You pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, it's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your genetic weak link is for you or your child. Yeah. That's where Arnold is gonna go after AABCD. And this is why a lot of people who have one autoimmune disorder have, you know, another and another and another. That's exactly right. And well, here's something for you. A study was published with celiac disease, meaning the shags were worn down, and that if a child was diagnosed with celiac disease before the age of two, 5% of them had other autoimmune diseases already mm -hmm. besides celiac. Right. Between the ages of two and four, it was 10.5%. It doubled. Between the ages of 4 and 10, it was 16.7% of these kids had other autoimmune diseases already. And between the ages of 10 and 20, it was 23%. Over the age of 20, 33% of these kids have other autoimmune diseases besides celiac disease. So the longer you wait, yeah. the more damage begins to accrue. Yeah. And so are you... Okay, so if you, once you have this, like, let's say it's non-celiac... Um, gluten sensitivity. And, you know, would you say that people could never eat that again? Like there's no way to heal so that, the, you know, your ch child could eat gluten again? That's a really good question. And the answer is with celiac disease, the answer is very, very clear. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Never again. My phrase for that is you can't be a little pregnant. Mm -hmm. You can't have a little gluten for celiacs. With the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, no one's ever published on it. So you can't say 
uh, definitively whether they're ever able to eat gluten again. Mm -hmm. But I'm, 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 I'm going to answer this more thoroughly for you. Because, but if you talk to immunologists, all immunologists tell you the same thing. Well, if I've made a memory B cell to gluten and I have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, does the memory B cell act the same as it does with celiac disease? Yes. Does it ever go away? Not that we know of. Mm. Does that mean that I cannot have gluten again? Yes. That line of logic is accurate. Mm -hmm. But no, no one's ever published on that because this is such a new condition. It was 2011. Remember the celiac symposium when they finally acknowledged there is this thing called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We better start studying this in more detail. Mm -hmm. So the answer is we don't know. But here's how you find out. You do the right test. Now, there's one test that we'll talk about in a minute. It. It's the only one that's out there that's, that's um, comprehensive. You do the right test. You see you've got the problem. You go completely gluten-free. You learn how to do it. Don't reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. There's lots of information out there about how to do it. So it's not as stressful for you. You go gluten-free. Six months to a year later, you recheck. The antibodies are gone. They're down to a normal range. Okay. Can, can I eat gluten now? The answer is, well, no one knows. But if you want to try, we don't recommend it. But, you know, I, I don't think you can. But if you want the information for yourself, here's what you do. You eat a little gluten for two weeks and then you wait another two weeks and then you do the blood test again. Because it takes about a month for the assembly line to get when you flip the switch. It takes about a month before you're sure you have elevated levels of the antibodies. Mm -hmm. So that's how you know. You ask the body the right question. You just have to do the right test. And then it doesn't matter how you feel because how you feel is the end stage after you've killed off enough tissue and your body can't compensate it anymore. How you feel is you start getting symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if, if you determine whether or not you're going to have a particular action, uh, if you're going to take action on something by how you feel, you're going to be one of the ones that is the statistic you know, likely the statistic that says shorter lifespan than their parents. That is very interesting because I've spoken to a lot of people who say that, you know, like, and I wonder, what do you think, like, is it the same thing as when you're dealing with other food sensitivities? Let's say you have a sensitivity to bananas or, you know, I don't know, like onions or, you know, eggs, eggs, like those big, those top al allergenic you know, the foods that people have sensitivities to, like, I won't use the word allergy, but sensitivity to like eggs, um, corn, dairy, well, gluten is one of those. And what's the other one? Soy. You know, are, is that the same thing? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, and and a lot of people will tell will tell me and, and and other people that you can if you heal the gut, which is you know probably the precursor to a lot of these sensitivities, then you may be able to reintroduce these foods. They're you, making it up. To that? Yeah. They're making it up. Interesting. They're making it up based on symptoms. Yeah. Be because there's no question that your symptoms go down if the food sensitivity caused the headaches, cause the attention deficit, cause the autism. They're making it up. Mm -hmm. And they think that if you don't get the headaches back, everything's okay. But that the, the symptoms are the end stage. If you've got elevated antibodies to myelin, killing off the myelin in your brain, mm -hmm. and you go on a gluten-free diet, and the myelin antibodies go down to normal in six months or a year, great, high five, you've done a great job, way to go. Well, can I eat gluten again? Well, I don't think so. but. It, but, well, my, my, my doctor said that as, as long as I rotate it every once in a while, it's okay. I said, oh, really? All right. Well, you know, if you're basing that on symptoms, is that what you want to base your, your decisions on, Mrs. Patient? Are the symptoms, now that you know that the tissue damage is accruing inside, killing off your myelin in this example, but you, you, don't, you don't have any symptoms from myelin that's being killed off. Mm -hmm. So do you want to know if the myelin antibodies are down or do you want to know if you have headaches? Yeah. And so once people have the bigger picture, they begin to understand, oh, so I just really need to ask a thorough question. I need to do the first test to see what the problem is. And then I do the test to show I've cured the problem, the real problem or not cured, wrong word. But I've, <laughs> I've, I've reduced the antibodies to a normal range. Yeah. And then, uh, can I eat the food again? Can I eat bananas or can I eat eggs again? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. But if you want to try, here's how you do it. So then you eat the eggs for a month and then you do the blood test and you see the myelin antibodies went back up again, but you feel fine. 
Okay, Mrs. Patient, so you know, it's up to you. Um, you. You do the blood test and you see you got this problem. You've got elevated myelin antibodies. Your child has elevated myelin antibodies. You go on a gluten-free and in this example, egg-free diet. Mm -hmm. And six months to a year later, your child's doing great. Headaches are gone. The attention deficit is under control without any drugs. And you recheck and the myelin antibodies are down, the gluten antibodies are down. We know you cannot have the gluten again. But if it's celiac, but if it's not celiac, we don't know for sure. But, well, can I eat gluten and eggs again? Well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But if you want to check, here's how you check. I don't recommend it, but if you're going to do it, here's how you do it safely, as safely as possible. And then you recheck a month later. If the myelin antibodies have come back up, but the attention deficit isn't manifesting, your child's still doing better in school, but their myelin antibodies are elevated, and you know when antibodies are elevated, you're killing off tissue. There's no downtime. It's killing off tissue all day, every day, mm -hmm. all day, every day. So it's up to you, Mrs. Patient. If you want to allow your child to eat this food, and the only thing different in the last month is that you've reintroduced eggs back into their diet or gluten in eggs. If you've done two of them, I'd recommend one at a time. Mm -hmm. But if you reintroduce eggs and the, only th and the only thing different, the attention deficit is not back, but the myelin antibodies have come back and it's killing off their myelin, that's protecting their nerves, it's up to you on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that you can tell for sure. That's the only way uh, as to whether or not you can reintroduce a food into the diet again. Everything else is theory. We now have the tools so that you can get clear information and it's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. This is what your immune system says. The Army is out in force or the Air Force or the Marines or the Coast Guard. It's out in force. It's out there trying to protect you. And it was calm at risk or at rest. Now it's red alert, red alert. Eggs are back, red alert, red alert. Mm. So it's up to you, Mrs. Patient, and what you want to do. Okay, so let's see. Okay, I don't want to be, beat a dead horse on this, but this is so interesting. I just have to keep asking you a couple of questions, okay? So let's say you have a child who comes back with a test, and you say do the proper test. And what you're talking about is the um, autoimmune response, right? Like, is that what you're talking about when you're talking about the, you know, antibodies? There are actually three tests that okay. need to be done mm -hmm. uh, for most people. So let's talk about the test. Sure, let's do it. Um, and I have talked about it in two different categories. First, I'll talk about the category of celiac disease. So in celiac disease, the blood test that's known now conclusively to be a good indicator of um, celiac disease is called transglutaminase. When you do the blood test for transglutaminase, if it comes back elevated, there are other things that can cause it, but the most common one is celiac disease. And then most often you're recommended to get an endoscopy with a biopsy. They stick a tube down your throat and they clip out a little piece of the intestines. They look at it under a microscope. Um, that may be necessary, maybe not. Depends on the blood test uh, and how high the numbers are. But uh, it's commonly accepted, and there are many papers that show transglutaminase, 97% accurate, 99% accurate, 100% accurate, depending on the paper you read. But I wrote to many of the authors of those papers, Dear Doctor, mm -hmm. when you checked for the accuracy of transglutaminase for celiac patients, did you include people in your test who had partial shags worn down or who had the inflammation before the shags wear down? Not, in other words, the earlier stages of celiac disease. Mm -hmm. And the answer every time is every time was no. Celiac mm -hmm. disease is total bilis atrophy, meaning the shags are worn down completely. So when they started doing tests to see the accuracy of transglutaminase, the blood test for celiac disease, when there was just partial wearing down of the shags, what they found was that the test was accurate to identify the problem somewhere between 2.7 to 3 out of 10 times, oh. meaning... It was wrong. Yeah. Seven out of 10 times, it missed the problem. It missed it. So it's a very, very accurate test if you're at the end stage and you've got total bilis atrophy, your mm -hmm. shags are worn down completely. The analogy I would give you for this is many of us have had a loved one or a neighbor that had a heart attack, they survived. And when they came home from the hospital, they said, oh, my doctor told me I had a heart attack once before. I never knew. Have you ever heard that before, Carla? Yeah, I have. Yeah. 
Well, how do they know that? It's because they did an EKG mm -hmm. and they found that there was heart damage. And that's how they knew this person had a heart attack previously. Well, that's like saying that you don't have a problem with celiac disease unless your shags are all completely worn down. So all, the only test you do is transglutaminase. That's like saying you don't have a problem with heart disease if your cholesterol is 400, mm -hmm. unless you have evidence of a previous heart attack. If you don't have evidence of a previous heart attack, there's no problem with your heart. If you don't have total villus atrophy, there's no problem with transglutaminase. No, you, you don't have a problem with wheat. Mm. So unfortunately, the transglutaminase test is only comprehensive and completely accurate to identify it if there's total villus atrophy. So you miss a lot of the celiac patients. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with identifying celiac disease. Now, what's more important is to identify if there's a gluten sensitivity with or without celiac disease. Right. And to identify a gluten sensitivity, I talked about the pearl necklace mm -hmm. breaking into big clumps, 17, 13, 33 pearl clumps. The only test that's ever been done to identify a gluten sensitivity, and every lab in the country does this test, looks at the 33 pearl clump called alpha gliadin. That's what they look at. And they, um, it's, it's an accurate test. The problem is 50% of celiacs don't have a problem with alpha gliadin. Mm -hmm. It comes back negative, but wait a minute, celiac disease is a problem with wheat. How come the test is negative? Well, it's because there's other clumps of the pearl necklace that the body is responding to. Mm -hmm. Well, how come, how come we're not checking the other clumps? Well, no one's ever thought about it. But the paper started coming out in 1999 saying that, hey, and, and in the research laboratories, they're looking at different clumps of the pearl necklace. And they find that, yeah, there's over 60 different clumps of the pearl necklace that stimulate an immune response if a person has a problem with it. There's over 60. Why are we checking only one? Mm. So a laboratory opened up uh, almost four years ago now that looks at multiple clumps of pearls from the necklace. The laboratory is called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X, CyrexLabs.com. You can get a lot of information about it on my website. My website is thedr.com, okay. the dr, the doctor.com. And we've got lots of information about the lab tests there. They're the only ones in the world at this point that are doing more than the alpha gliadin to look for gluten sensitivity. They look for 10 different clumps of the pearl necklace. You don't get false negatives anymore, meaning if there's a problem, you don't miss it. Mm -hmm. It will be identified. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm so tickled. Now, for full disclosure, I helped to open that lab. I was a consultant for that lab a year before they opened and two years after they opened, but I disassociated myself over a year and a half ago so I'd come out in the world and be aggressive to talk to everybody about, hey, just think about these tests. Mm -hmm. Just think about them because I have no financial interest. I should, but I don't. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> right? But they are the best tests in the world. You want to find out if your kids have a problem, it's the um, Cyrex array number three, okay. multiple peptides of gluten. Okay. And, and you'll see the explanations for it on my website, thedr.com. Awesome. Okay. So, and if you're finding, you know, like you said, if you, if you just feel like your kids feel like hack, you know, that's, it's a really good thing to, to check out. One of the first things you should check out is gluten sensitivity. And I just want to return to this. Okay. One more question about food sensitivities, because I have children who have multiple food sensitivities. So I'm like, like some parents that are listening right now, I'm freaking out. Yeah, to this may because, I address that? Yes, please, because I'm free. Okay, and I'll tell you why I'm freaking out, because there's always this hope that we can, you know, fix everything. And there are certain things that we can fix. You know, of course, like if we're talking about leaky gut, we want to deal with that, of course, you know. But also, too, like, are there things, you know, and then once we fix that, you know, we may, you know, the thought of one of my children who has got lots of sensitivities to really things that are in everything, garlic, you know, one of them is garlic, one of them is onion. One of them is three of them have eggs. You know, it's just like it's insane what we have to watch for. And so I don't know if it's the test that we need to find the right test or, you know, retest later. And a lot of people say elimination is good. So it's a huge topic, Dr. Tom. And uh, if you could just give me what your first thoughts are on that, just help me out here. Because as a parent, like I said, I'm just I'm freaking out. I understand. Yeah. Why 
do children have multiple foods they're sensitive to? Yeah. And you, you referred to it. The, the shags of the shag carpeting, remember this tube, one big long donut, and the shags of the shag carpeting that absorb all of our nutrients? Yeah. The shags are covered with a cheesecloth. The cheesecloth only lets really small molecules get through into the bloodstream. It's mm -hmm. a way of protecting us, right? It's like, you know, grandma's cheesecloth and you pour the gravy into the cheesecloth and so no clumps of flour get through into the gravy. So the mm -hmm. gravy's nice and smooth and all that. The cheesecloth covering the shags in the intestines gets torn because of inflammation in the gut and gluten causes that tearing. The tearing of the cheesecloth is called leaky gut mm -hmm. or intestinal permeability, right? Mm -hmm. So now these molecules that are coming through, you eat food, digestive enzymes are the scissors that are breaking down all the proteins into smaller little pieces, smaller little pieces, small, as they keep going down, the further down the tube, the tougher proteins, uh, take, they take longer to get broken down. The, the pearls of uh, the amino acids from those tougher proteins are absorbed lower down in the intestines because it takes longer for them to get broken down. Mm -hmm. They're still big clumps and they can't get through the cheesecloth. But when you've got tears in the cheesecloth, these clumps that aren't ready to be absorbed yet get through the tears into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Now your immune system says, what the heck, what is this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. Now you're allergic to bananas. Mm -hmm. Now you're allergic to onions. Now, you know, now you're allergic to the, all these foods. And it's not an immune system that's gone crazy. It's an immune system that's doing exactly what it's supposed to do to protect you. Okay. Because these macromolecules are a, are, are a threat. They're not supposed to be in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. but the cheesecloth got torn. So you have to first heal the cheesecloth. You've got to, and that's not easy. It's not a simple pill that does that. That's another conversation, another interview in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and these docs that say, just take some glutamine and you're fine. Well, it's more complicated than that. Okay. But um, I guess if there's a message that I could get to your parents is that this is a wake-up call. The wake-up call is that our world is extremely toxic now. Your children have a shorter projected lifespan than you do. The World Health Organization rates the United States number two in the world in overall health. The problem is it's number two from the bottom. Wow. We're, we're the second worst in the world. But people don't know this because it's not in the newspaper. You've got no way of reading these studies and it's, it's kept from you. Yeah. It should be headlines on the front page, but it's kept from you. But it's critically important that you understand the healthcare system in this country does not work. Just look at the numbers. You know, there's a joke, you know, that you say to people, you say, well, I do this and this. And the joke is, you say, oh, yeah? How's that working for you? Mm. As, as they're popping their uh, meds for their migraines or for whatever their problems are. Mm -hmm. How's that working for you doing that? Well, on the big picture, the healthcare system is like, how's that working for the health of your family? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not working very well, which means you've got to learn, moms, and dads, you've got to learn about the healthcare system to, at some level, how lousy it is, so you know how to use it as a smart consumer. Mm -hmm. You know how to work with your pediatricians and ask the right questions. And if your pediatricians are frustrated and they, they don't want to talk to you, find a new pediatrician. Mm -hmm. They'll get the message soon enough. But yeah. you've got, uh, the moms have to get educated about this and yes, Carla, I know it's overwhelming when you've got one child that's garlic, one child that's onions and bananas, one child that's gluten and eggs, or three that it's eggs. Mm -hmm. I know, I know, but that's the state of it. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah. You've got to deal with it. And excuse me for being blunt, but I've got to be, because <laughs> okay. nobody's going to talk to you guys like this. Yeah. you got to deal with it or your kids are going down early. Yeah. If, if you don't like suck it in, and understand the overview, the umbrella overview of the healthcare system we're dealing with. It's not simple, it's not easy. You've got to get educated on how to do this, mm -hmm. how to really encourage, you've got to salvage, you've got to patch up the damage that's been done, eliminate the environmental toxins as much as you can. That means you put a chlorine filter on your drinking water. Mm -hmm. You put a chlorine filter in your shower so you're not breathing it in. You buy organic whenever you can because GMO foods are nasty. Mm -hmm. They're just nasty. 
and you just start learning this stuff as much as you can and you do the pieces that you can and every month, every week, every month, you're, you're going to learn something new and it's just going to take time. Yep. Uh, there's no easy way. And if I can say this, most of our young parents now are lazy. They're just lazy. They've gotten accustomed to, I get what I want when I want it. Mm. And I want my kid, you know, I don't, you know, I want my kids to have cookies. Well, learn how to bake gluten-free cookies if they have a gluten sensitivity. You know, you just got to give it to them. Yeah. So what you're doing, your health summit for kids is a great, great way for this audience. And I, I hope you take this little caption and use it as a marketing piece for you <laughs> that everyone needs to hear this health summit if they have kids. Yeah. Because I know your focus is on kids, Carla, and you, you brought in a number of great speakers that are talking about different aspects of all of this. I'm just talking about one aspect of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So when you're talking about, he, you know, my last question was, well, actually I had two, but, my, you know, was how do we heal them? And you, you really gave a good rundown just now about how we do that. We find out, we educate ourselves, we, you know, get involved, we, we look for the roots and not treat like all the symptoms that we see because the symptoms are actually the end stage. So we don't want to get to that point. And if we're at that point, we need to undo some damage. You know, try to try to um, to heal up our kids with good food and good water and getting off the things that are actually damaging them in their system. So I really appreciate that rundown. That was excellent, Dr. Tom. And if you, I'm going to just ask you, do you have like three minutes left of your time? Of course. Okay, because there was something that I promised that we were going to talk about at the beginning of the interview and we didn't even get to it, <laughs> which was how gluten affects our kids' brains. So, yeah, just it might be a huge question to end with, but I think that it's actually a really big question that I thought would be really uh, a good thing to, to touch on before we left. It's a great question, and let me let me give you this study um, that I talk about. I love this study. You know, in Finland, they have the highest level of cardiovascular disease of any industrialized country, and the government wanted to find out: can we identify the triggers that cause cardiovascular disease in our kids, so that maybe we can prevent them from developing? cardiovascular disease. So they sent out an invitation to 5,000 families mm -hmm. uh, and said, hey, we'd like to follow your kids for the next 25 years. And we'll do all the tests for free, all the blood tests, all the evaluations. If they need any treatments, all the treatments will be free. We want to try to pre uh, prevent the development of cardiovascular disease. Would you be willing to allow us to, um, uh, would you like your child to be a part of this uh, study and 2,427 of them uh, said yes. Uh, after 20 years, there were 2,427 uh, still in the study uh, after 20 years. So, what happened to these kids? And they did blood on them every year. They got their grades. They uh, hired plenty of extracurriculars. Any trouble with the law? Any trouble with at school? parents' causes of death, all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did they find, uh, this, this is what they said, the, the subjects, they're now in their 30s, other researchers asked, oh, you've got all this blood, because they, they freeze the blood every year. Uh, every year. Can, can we have some of the blood? We want to check them for silent celiac disease, meaning they didn't have gut problems or these people didn't know they had celiac disease and they've been eating wheat all this time. Can we check their blood? They said, sure. So they got the blood. They found there was just over 50 of these kids that were silent celiacs, meaning they didn't know that they had a problem with wheat. Mm -hmm. They've been eating wheat now for 20, 25 years. Uh, they're in their early 30s. Yeah. And this is what they said. The subjects with silent celiac did not differ from the rest of the group in age, gender, stature, weight, medical diagnoses, health concerns, use of alternative medications, physical activity, or their parents' causes of death. Same kids, same neighborhoods, all the same. Those people that had silent celiac disease, 5.3% of them went on to get a university or college degree. Those kids without celiac disease, 23%, mm. four times more. Those kids with silent celiac disease, 28% uh, of them worked in managerial or professional positions. Mm -hmm. Those kids without celiac disease, 45%, mm. working hard, being promoted. 
So what they found, see, what, what happens to your kids, if they have a gluten sensitivity, it's the most common symptom. There are many symptoms, but it's the most common one. What happens is it's, it's like a dimmer switch yeah. on their brain function. And I call it the dumbed down switch. They get dumbed down. Mm -hmm. And so you say to this guy, hey, I noticed that the three buddies that you went to high school with and you hung out with all the time, that they all went to college and you didn't. They said, yeah, I didn't do well in my SATs. That's all right. I'm happy. And hopefully he's happy. You know, when he's a 30-year-old and he's like a tradesman, like a carpenter or something, does really beautiful work and has a beautiful family. But what was his potential that never got tapped because of the dimmer switch on his brain? Mm -hmm. what, and the, the title of this paper was Undiagnosed Silent Celiac Disease, a Risk for Underachievement, that these kids just don't achieve the way you know they can. You mm -hmm. know the skills they got, but they just can't fire up their brain. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's 14 different mechanisms as to why that occurs, but the most common one, this will be the last point I'll give you okay. in answer to your question here, yeah. the most common mechanism is that blood flows into your brain two ways. You've got the garden hoses coming up your neck called the carotid arteries. And at the top of the garden hose, there's a nozzle like a spray. And it's like you're watering your lawn. And there's studies called spec scans. The spec scans look at how well are you watering your lawn? And are you saturating your lawn? Because I'm originally from the Midwest, and in the Midwest, we know that you can't water your lawn for five minutes a day. The grass dies. Mm -hmm. You have to water it for a half hour to an hour, once or twice a week. you got to soak it. Because when you soak it, then the roots get the water because the blades of grass don't absorb the water. It's got to get down to the roots, mm -hmm. right? So the spec scan looks to see how well um, is your brain being saturated with blood. And what did they find out? They found out that those people with gluten sensitivity, 73% of them had a lack of blood flow into the brain. And it always included the frontal part of the brain called the frontal lobes where depression and anxiety come from. The average was one third of their brain didn't get enough blood. That was the average. So this is what I say to docs. Wow. Cross your legs for two hours. Stand up and run. Yeah. You fall on your face because there's no blood in your legs. Give your child pancakes for breakfast. If they have a gluten sensitivity, send them to school to learn. Mm. They can't. And they get diagnosed with attention deficit because yeah. their brain's not functioning well. It's not working the way it should. Why do you think they give Adderall and Ritalin to kids with attention deficit? Those drugs are speed. Mm. Why do you give speed to a kid to slow them down? Mm -hmm. This is why. This is why. If you ever had an old car, you know, early days, I mean, I had, I had 13 cars that were under $100, you know, <laughs> because, you know, I worked my way through school. I didn't have any money, right? So you get yeah. a car until it dies, right? Yeah. You, ne you never get a tune-up on one of those cars, never. Yeah. Yeah. They cost, a tune-up costs more than the car, mm -hmm. right? Some of those cars would stall at the red light. How do you stop a car from stalling at the red light? You put it in neutral and you give it a little gas. Mm -hmm. And you're not hot rodding, you're just revving the engine so it doesn't stall. Mm. Light turns green, you drop it and drive and off you go. You give your kids speed to get their engines running back to normal again. When they don't have enough blood flow getting into the brain, their engine is spittering and sputtering. Mm -hmm. And so you give them speed. The problem is Ritalin shrinks the brain. Yeah. And it causes lots of problems, right? And, but you just want your kid to do well in school. You're trying to do the best that you can, mm -hmm. but you're dealing with the symptoms yeah. when you're dealing with attention deficit. You gotta find a doctor who knows about the trigger, the cause. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many good sources of information for that now. Dr. Charles Parker is a great one who, if he's not on your summit, um, I'd be happy to give you an introduction uh, to him for this one or for your next summit. He's for brilliant sure. at talking about attention deficit in kids, brilliant. Mm -hmm. But there are many good sources of information for you. You have to deal with the underlying trigger. If your child has a gluten sensitivity, the most common food that people are sensitive to, and food is the most common environmental trigger, mm -hmm. if they have a gluten sensitivity, 73% of them have a lack of blood flow going into the brain. Yeah. And that's serious. That's, that's serious. That's serious. 
Yeah. So uh, thank you, Dr. Tom, for explaining that. And, you know, take away uh, from this interview, well, many, many, many of them, but really get to the root what is causing it. Often gluten sensitivity or sensitivity to other foods or um, can be uh, one of those things that can be causing all kinds of things that you see happening with your kids and not just symptoms, but groups of symptoms that have been identified as conditions like ADHD or ADD, right? So, Correct. yeah, so just dig and get in there as parents so that I really love your spirit and your passion and your um, dedication and caring about these kids and getting this message out because I'm with you all the way, Dr. Tom, and I really appreciate you being here and giving a lot of your time, actually well over an hour to uh, give us the goods. And, you know, there's a lot of information to come away with, but parents and caregivers, there's a lot of resource, resources out there in research and people that can help. And so, um, Dr. Tom, your website is the dr.com, the doctor.com. And anything else you'd like to mention to our listeners, caregivers, parents, uh, that that's coming up for you or that you'd like uh, any way to, for them to get more information or um, about what you're doing. Thank you. There's two things. Okay. Thank you. Yes. At the dr.com, you can get lots of information there uh, about the test. Lots of interviews with me or there are radio shows uh, people can listen to. And um, uh, at www.theglutensummit.com. Mm, yes. I'd recommend that everyone gets the Gluten Summit and listens to these world exports experts <laughs> explaining what I've just gone through. I whiz through in an hour, but yeah. they go through it much more detail in their own words. And you just listen to it and you go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. It's, and you it's just fantastic. Don't. I'm going to second that. I have that summit and it's amazing. Yes, please. I mean, it's such a, I'm so proud of producing that, that it's changed the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of people to get a healthy respect for this and then to get an understanding of where you get started on all of that. So between the doctor.com, the glutensummit.com, you will have a great overview of this one topic in the world of environmental triggers and the development of autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the big kahuna picture. That's the big kahuna picture. And my last message to these parents, these young parents is, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you just have to suck it up. <laughs> you have to suck it up and learn that you, you know, it's a big job that you're getting into, but it's your child's lives yeah. and it's your child's brains and giving them these drugs temporarily to help them function while you deal with the underlying mechanisms, you'll minimize the damage from these drugs, mm -hmm. whether they're inhalers for asthma or Adderall and Ritalin for attention deficit, that the, the drugs have side effects. Mm -hmm. Just read the labels on the drugs and you see the side effects and we, we kind of bury that information So because we just want our kids to be able to breathe. Of course, of course you do. Mm -hmm. But where is it coming from? Well, I asked my pediatrician, he doesn't know. That's because he hasn't had the training in functional medicine. The, your pediatrician's job is in pharmacology. And some of them are really good at other stuff. They've learned after medical school some of the other things, but some of them haven't. Mm -hmm. And so you want a number of members on your healthcare team. You don't fire your pediatrician, but you bring on other members to the healthcare team. Maybe it's a nutritionist. Maybe it's a general practitioner that's a specialist in functional medicine. The site for functional medicine is functionalmedicine.org. Mm -hmm. And, and we, uh, I'm on the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, and we teach doctors how do you develop the big picture so that when you've got a patient that comes in with asthma, of course you know how to get the asthma under control immediately, but how do you get rid of the asthma? Mm -hmm. That's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what our parents have to demand answers to. And unfortunately, you've, you're gonna have to be a vigilant warrior to protect your child. You do the drugs when you need them for as long as you need them, absolutely, but you put tremendous amount of attention on why does my child need this drug and how do I reduce the need for this drug? Yep, and it's a lot of work, but worth every second and I'll, I'll attest to that, yeah, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much again, Dr. Tom, for your time and energy and this has been awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Carla. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you.